Thank you. So uh, you guys are watching this amazing conference. Amazing conference. Stephen, that's an applause for you for setting up this amazing conference. Let's give him an applause. Now, I'm going to do a pretest for you. I'm going to ask you some questions. Be honest, and uh, we'll find out where you're at now, and then we're going to find out where you are in about an hour. I want you to rate yourself from 1 to 100 how vigilant you've been at avoiding GMOs. Now, that includes going out to eat. It includes what you ever had, what you had today. It includes going over to friends' houses. So your whole one score aggregate. One means what's a GMO. A uh, hundred means, like, your friends are going to say, here they come again, don't talk about GMOs to them. <laughs> All right, so, most Americans on a scale of one to a hundred are about minus seven. So I'm giving you permission to be a non-carer at this point. In two minutes, forget it. But right now, you can be completely unconcerned and it's okay to raise your hand in the lowest category of vigilance, which is 1 to 20. How many put themselves as 1 to 20? Raise your hand and keep them up. Raise your hand, look around. We're going to do a pretest, looking at the whole group. Okay, 20 to 40. 20 to 40. Give yourself a rating of 20 to 40. One person. 40 to 60. 60 to 80. 80 to 100. All right, so for those that weren't watching and for those that are on the camera, it was fairly evenly spread, 20, the first four categories, and then there was a, a larger group that was 80 to 100. This, after all, is an elite group of real truth about healthy health nuts. Okay, rate yourself from 1 to 100, how active you've been talking to, to people about GMOs. How many people are low active? 1 to 20, raise your hand. Low active, not talking so much. 20 to 40? 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100. Same thing, even more 80 to 100s in this thing. Any 120s like me? Yeah, a few of you, yes, I know. I get your emails <laughs> at 2 in the morning. So we're going to talk about why it's imperative to avoid GMOs. And like Stephen said, you don't have to memorize it. You can just share the link with people so that... Uh, that will do the work for you. If you want to learn how to speak on GMOs at responsibletechnology.org, we have a speaker training program, seven-hour online course, PowerPoint, fully scripted. You can learn all the details about that. You're asking a question already? Really? Okay. Is there a cell phone app? We had a cell phone app uh, for selecting non-GMO but it didn't stay current, so we're, we're redoing it. So right now, we don't have a cell phone app. There are others that have a cell phone app, not as good as the one we used to have, but we're going to have one that's coming out. You can go to website at uh, nongmoshoppingguide.com for that. Now, I'm wearing black on black. Do I disappear? No. You can see me? All right. I remember one time I watched a video and it was just my hands moving in space. <laughs> <laughs> it was bizarre. All right, so... Um, I want to ask you, for those of you, I mean, a lot of you are actually been avoiding GMOs. Um, for those of you that are largely avoiding GMOs, how many noticed an improvement in health when you switched? Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. That's a lot for this audience. That's a lot. Now, what kind of improvements did you notice? Energy. Energy. Okay, how many of you notice improvements in energy? Raise your hand. About 23. See, that actually is the number two most common effect of switching to non-GMO based on my asking over 125 audiences this question. Okay, what's another one? No Clarity. Clarity. I actually mix the two up just because, you know, less brain fog, more energy. Absolutely. What's another one? Oh, wait, anyone else have more clarity? Okay. Anyone else have more clarity? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. What's another one? Okay. No illness. Hold on. I can't. Do, what, what? Aches and pains. Yes. Any aches and pains out there that got better? That's a very common one. We're going to call that third tier. So the second tier is energy. 
and brain fog. The third tier has a whole bunch of things you're about to hear. The first one, appetite, appetite gastrointestinal, digestive. Watch how many hands. How many people notice an improvement in digestion? Raise your hand. See? Always happens. Always the number one. What about another? Hormones. Absolutely. Anyone else with hormones? Okay. Uh, immune system issues. Allergies, asthma, autoimmune disease. Got some hands up. Headaches. Yep, headaches. Um, skin issues. Definitely skin issues. Um, weight. Did you start losing weight when you got off of GMOs? Anyone? Yes, yes, definitely. Some there too. Mood. Not just energy, but mood, like depression and all that stuff. Okay, yeah. Anything else? I had someone yell out, a woman yell out, erectile dysfunction. I instantly said, okay, raise your hand if you had erectile dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? All right. This is a good start because we're going to talk about how in the world GMOs might cause these wide range of disorders and diseases. And first of all, what, what's on the market that's already genetically engineered? We have soy, corn, cotton, canola, and sugar beets and alfalfa. All of those are used as animal feed, and all but one is the vast majority of them. Then we have two traits for these. The primary trait is herbicide tolerant, and the primary one of those is called Roundup Ready. Monsanto scientists found bacteria growing in a chemical waste dump near their factory, surviving in the presence of Roundup, so they figured, great, let's put it in the food supply. So they took the gene out of the bacterium and put it into soybeans. Now you could spray the field of soybeans with Roundup, killing just the weeds and not the soybeans. And the Roundup gets absorbed into the plant. 15 to 20% leave through the roots. The rest stay in the plant. A lot of it stays in the soybean, which then enters our body if we eat the soybean. There's also corn and cotton that produce its own toxic insecticide. Then, of course, there's... Hawaiian or Chinese papaya, and some zucchini and crookneck squash, and now we have an apple and potato on the horizon if they, in fact, introduce it. It's been approved. My friend Stephen Drucker was here a couple of nights ago speaking. He'll be here tonight at the panel. He is the one that I quote. He's, his work I quote almost every time I speak. He launched a, a, a lawsuit against the FDA showing this fraud. They're sentence in the policy, which is public, is in front of you, saying, we looked and looked and didn't find anything wrong with GMOs, not even a difference. And on that basis, no testing was necessary, no labeling was necessary. So companies like Monsanto, who told us that PCBs, Agent Orange, and DDT were safe, can determine on their own if their GMOs are safe, not even tell the FDA or consumers. Well, it turns out the person in charge of this policy was, of course, Monsanto's former attorney, Michael Taylor, who then became Monsanto's vice president. Now he's back at the FDA as the U.S. food safety czar. And according to Steve Drucker's lawsuit, he was one of the people combing through 44,000 secret internal memos that the FDA was forced to divulge because of his lawsuit and discovered that the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA was exactly the opposite that GMOs, according to them, could create allergens, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems, and they were ignored. Now they've been vindicated, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, six years ago, just looking at the animal feeding studies, said it's a serious health danger. Animals are being um, hurt with gastrointestinal problems and immune system problems and, and dysfunctional regulation of cholesterol and insulin, and there's a list for you on the, board, on the slide of the things that were happening in the animal studies at the time that they reviewed in 2009. Now, if you extrapolate from this list, you'll find a lot of the things that we just talked about in the room that you guys are getting better from on this list, okay? So, the animals are inflicted it, with it if they're eating GMOs, you're liberated from it when you get off of GMOs. So what have we heard when individuals get off of GMOs? Well, this is 
a list of what I hear on stage asking people and asking doctors to tell me what they're noticing in their patients. And so some of these were mentioned, but also things like restless leg syndrome, autistic symptoms, colds and flu, frequent, frequent sickness, memory loss, and again, memory loss. So there's a, there's a lot of symptoms that we hear over and over again in people. Now, when you get rid of GMOs, what do you do? How do you do it? Eat organic. Now, when you buy organic, you also get rid of atrazine and all these other things. So it introduces cofactors. What's another way to avoid GMOs? Reduce processed foods. Processed foods have so many nasties in them. How do you know that you're getting better is related to the non-GMO component of your new diet or getting rid of something else that was nasty? It's hard to say. But when livestock go off of GMOs, it's just substituting non-GM corn for GM corn or non-GM soy for GM soy. No cofactors to try and worry about. And they're getting better from same type of things that humans are getting better from, that the animals are afflicted with when they're fed GMOs in labs. The same things that pets, cats and dogs, are described as getting better from by veterinarians and pet owners. So we see repeating patterns, afflicting lab animals, getting better in humans and, and livestock and pets, and disease rates now on the rise in the U.S. population in parallel with the introduction and expansion of GMOs. This is deaths from senile dementia. Uh, I could just look over here. Deaths, I mean, excuse me, deaths due to stroke. Deaths due to stroke. And you'll notice the green line is a straight line. That's the trend. That was the trend before 1996. Something happened in 1996 which pushed the totals above that trend. Now one of the contenders for that was the introduction of genetically modified soy and corn. And you can see in the blue line that's the percentage of GM soy and corn in the United States. Then there was the Roundup sprayed on the Roundup Ready soy and corn. That's the red line. Now, this is correlation. This is not causation. We don't know if the red and the blue lines are the cause as to why these straight yellow lines are now taller. But we're going to look at several diseases and see if they are, in fact, pushed up around the time that GMOs and Roundup started to be introduced into our diet. Any questions about this chart? Because we're going to go through the other ones really quickly. All right. I'm just going to name them. Deaths due to stroke. Deaths due to senile dementia. And that's just plotted against glyphosate. So some will be against glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. And some will be both. This is deaths from Alzheimer's. This is deaths from Parkinson's disease. Deaths due to obesity. Deaths due to kidney failure. Hepatitis C. Deaths due to high blood pressure. Deaths due to intestinal infection. Inflammatory bowel disease. Autism. Diabetes, congenital birth defects, bile duct cancer and liver cancer, pelvic and kidney cancer, urinary and bladder cancer, thyroid cancer, deaths due to leukemia, ADHD, anemia, anxiety, dementia, insomnia, and schizophrenia. Now, one thing we can conclude is that America is sick and getting sicker. Now, I'm proposing that GMOs and glyphosate are not just coincidentally rising in parallel with these diseases, but actually, they have a causative effect. 
for perhaps all of them. Now, I'm not the only one that believes that. Thousands of doctors, many, many scientists believe it. So what could possibly be causing such a variety of diseases and disorders? I'm going to show three possible explanations. The first is the process of genetic engineering itself. The process of taking a gene, let's say you want to create a plant that produces its own toxic insecticide to break open the stomach of insects to kill them. So you take soil bacterium called Bt, or Bacillus thuringiensis, because it produces Bt toxin, which breaks open the stomach of insects to kill them. You take the gene out that produces the toxin, multiply that gene by millions of fold, put it into a gun, shoot that gun into a plate of millions of corn cells, clone those cells into a plant, and now every single cell of that corn plant has a gene-sized spray bottle, which kills insects. Now, in the meantime, the DNA of that corn plant has been changed. Thousands, hundreds or thousands of mutations. Two to four percent of the genome is different because of those mutations primarily. You can have genes that are switched on, genes that are switched off, genes that are deleted. And even before you clone, just the insertion of a gene might change the expression levels of those genes up to five percent of them, which could be a thousand different genes. So, these, this is the background noise. When you randomly switch genes and on and off, you can create what the FDA scientists said. Allergens, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. They don't look at these changes before they put the crops on the market. Years after Monsanto's most popular BT corn was put on the market, independent scientists found that a gene was switched on to produce gamazine, a known allergen. So people may be dying from eating Monsanto's genetically engineered corn from a product that's unlabeled, that was not evaluated by any regulatory agency in the world, discovered years later by scientists, and then promptly ignored. In their soy, there's all sorts of changes, including up to seven-fold increase in a known soy allergen. There's also an increase in lignin, which is linked to the production of rotenone, which is linked to Parkinson's disease. So genetically engineered soy might increase your risk of Parkinson's disease. So already, what have we looked at? Random changes in the genome that can produce toxins, allergens, carcinogens, or nutritional problems. Which of those diseases that we just saw might be stimulated or exacerbated by these type of changes? Potentially every one of them. Potentially every one of them. So this alone, whether you're creating a golden rice with that vitamin A, or who knows what, the process itself might explain the wide variety of diseases. The second cause of problems, we talked about the BT toxin. What about that BT toxin? Is it safe? According to the EPA, which regulates the amount of pesticides put out there, the pesticide portion in the corn, they said it's safe. They said, put it right in the corn. Because farmers use the BT spray already. And it has a history of safe use in the food supply. Well, the, B, the EPA scientists ignored their own advisors. The scientific advisory panel pointed out that the BT in spray form creates immune reactions in humans and animals. It can cause damage to the intestines in animals. And said, it's clear that, there are, that, there's, that these things indicate that. We need to evaluate it. The EPA ignored them. And just let corn produce its own Bt toxin, even though the Bt in the crops is not the same as the Bt in the spray. So not only was the spray dangerous, but the Bt in the corn is thousands of times more concentrated, designed to be more toxic, have properties of an allergen. And unlike the spray, it doesn't wash off and biodegrade. It sits in encapsulated in the cells of the corn that we eat. And just as the spray created immune system responses in lab animals, so too did mice get an immune response from eating the Bt corn. 
Same thing with rats, Monsanto's own rats. In India, thousands of animals, livestock, died when they were grazing on the BT cotton plants after harvest. Thousands of farm workers reported itching and allergic reactions when exposed to the BT. I looked at those reactions according to a doctor's report and compared it to the reactions of those who were sprayed with BT, and they're the same. Whether they're touching the BT cotton plants or sprayed with BT in the Pacific Northwest when it was sprayed for gypsy moth infestation and about 500 people had allergic or flu-like symptoms. Thousands of sheep died after grazing on cotton plants. Here's one village I visited. All 13 of their buffalo died after grazing on BT cotton plants for a single day. They also lost 26 goats and sheep. And I asked them, how many of you have noticed itching rashes in your bodies after working in the field? Most raised their hand. BT toxin is designed to break open the stomach of insects to kill them with little holes. In 2012, in the Journal of Applied Toxicology, it was found that BT toxin pokes holes in human cells. Now, just looking at these aspects of BT toxin, what could, explain, what could it explain from the preceding list chart? All of the immune system responses, right? Because it's an immune trigger. And now all the gastrointestinal problems because it's going to be poking holes, theoretically, up and down the gastrointestinal tract. Now, how many people here have heard of leaky gut? All right, so we're preaching to the choir or you're all very sick. <laughs> so leaky gut is holes in the walls of the intestines. Now, when that happens, it's linked to cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autoimmune disease, inflammation, and food allergies, among others. So that's another group that's on the list, right? Just the leaky gut. Here's how it's related to autoimmune disease. When you eat food, normally it's broken down into eensy beensy pieces. That's a technical term. And then these get into the bloodstream. Now, when there's holes in the intestines, it's only one cell thick. Undigested food proteins can get into the bloodstream. And then the immune system attacks it, thinking it's a, an invader. And then they all get out their cell phones, right? And it, they all take pictures of the invader. They have very old cell phones in the body. They haven't been upgrading. So they take a picture, post it on the Facebook, and it's kind of fuzzy. But the Facebook says, anything that looks like this, go after it and all the immune system checks their Facebook and then goes after anything that looks like that. But because it's fuzzy, you know what also looks like that is the thyroid or the pancreas or the microvilli lining the intestine. That's what autoimmune disease is. It's based on faulty iPhones. It's when the body attacks itself thinking that it's something else. It's molecular mimicry. And that is correlated very tightly with leaky gut. And autoimmune disease is on the rise, for sure. So, BT toxin, leaky gut, more diseases than it can, it can explain. Now, 93% of the women in Canada tested, they were pregnant women, had BT toxin in their blood. And so did 80% of their unborn fetuses. How did it get in the blood? Maybe it got through those holes that it created. If it gets into the blood, it may be toxic to blood cells, as was shown in this study on mice. If it gets in the blood, how long would it stay there? Not very long. It should wash out quickly. If it washes out quickly, how come 93% of the pregnant women tested had it in their blood? They must be eating it regularly. But this was Canada, not Mexico. They don't eat corn tortillas every day in Canada. Most of the corn that people ingest every day in Canada has no more BT toxin in it, high fructose corn syrup, corn oil, no more BT toxin. So where'd they get the constant source? Scientists speculated that it was the milk and meat of animals because those, milk, those animals eat BT corn every day. I think there's another possible explanation. In the only human feeding study ever conducted 
on commercialized GMOs, they found that part of the gene inserted into Roundup Ready soybeans transferred into the DNA of bacteria living inside our intestines and stayed there on a stable basis. And that that gut bacteria was unkillable with glyphosate, suggesting but not proving that once it transferred, it continued to function, producing genetically modified proteins 24-7 inside our intestines. They stopped all research. Once they found that, this was funded by the UK government, pro-GMO. As soon as they realized that happened, they pulled the plug on the funding. They never looked to see if the BT gene transfers from corn chips, from polenta, from corn on the cob, taking residence in your gut bacteria and turning it into living pesticide factories. We don't know if it does, but if it does, that might explain why 93% of the pregnant women tested in Canada had BT toxin in their blood because they were producing it in their intestines. So just looking at the BT, we can see that that might explain a lot of the problems. But Roundup and pesticides or herbicides that are sprayed on the crops have an even longer list than BT toxin. Because the weeds have outsmarted Monsanto and are now resistant to Roundup, there's more than half a billion pounds increase in herbicide use in the first 16 years. Now, the way Roundup kills weeds is very interesting. If you spray round, Roundup or glyphosate on a crop in sterile soil, you will stunt it, but you won't kill it. If you spray the same crop in field soil, you will kill it. This is like a quiz. You have 30 minutes to try and figure it out. It's a very interesting trick how that works. Here's how it works. First of all, it chelates minerals. By chelating, it means it binds with minerals. We all have heard of chelation in terms of cleaning up the body, binding with the heavy metals, ushering them out of the body. But this binds with the minerals that we want. Zinc, selenium, cobalt, calcium, manganese, magnesium, etc., etc. It grabs onto it and it makes it unusable by the plant. And so, not only does it not get in, but if a little bit gets in, it's hard to transport. No, I don't have that here. All right, so it's hard to transport. So very, very little of the minerals make it into the plant. Now, when you don't have those minerals in the plant, the normal metabolic functions in the plant cannot perform. And what do those metabolic functions do? Defend the plant against disease. Remember that for later, okay? Defenseless, weak, sick plants. Put it over here. It also kills beneficial bacteria. What does the beneficial bacteria do? Well, normally it takes minerals and makes it assimilable, usable by the plant. Kill the gut beneficial gut bacteria, even less minerals. Weak and sick defenses plant. What else does the beneficial bacteria do? It keeps the population of the diseases in the soil lower. So now the diseases in the soil start to rise. Some of you are getting it. What else does the glyphosate do? The glyphosate feeds the fungal-based pathogens in the soil so it expands even more. So what kills the plants? The soil-borne pathogens kill the defenseless plants. That's how it works. It's a, it's a perfect storm of disease and death. It creates an immune, basically an immune dysfunction in the plant, not really immune, but call it that, and it increases the diseases in the soil. So there's now more than 40 plant diseases on the rise in the U.S. because of the use of Roundup. And the Roundup sticks around in the soil, sometimes for decades, depending on the constituents in the soil. And if you look at just this model and you transplant it to humans and you think of chelation and killing beneficial bacteria and promoting disease, it's a perfect fit. Actually, there's more than what it does. It's, there's a lot more than it does. Let's just take a look very quickly. So we're eating Roundup Ready crops that don't have assimilable minerals in it. So we're eating mineral deficient crops. We're also eating mineral deficient animals because the primary food for livestock in the United States is Roundup Ready crops. 
So there's a universal deficiency of certain minerals in our meat supply. So we eat weak and sick plants, weak and sick animals, and we eat residues of Roundup, which further chelate our minerals, making them unavailable. So that's, that alone can provide a long list of diseases. But it's also an antibiotic. Remember, it kills the beneficial bacteria in the soil. It kills the beneficial bacteria in our gut, the stuff that we buy, that we pay for, the lactobacillus, the bifidus, etc. but not the salmonella, the E. coli, and the botulism, not the negative stuff, which can overgrow. Now, gut bacteria, it's like the new tofu. The microbiome is big. The microbiome is big. It's huge. It, people are realizing the microbiome is so important to health for detoxification, for digestion, for immunity. And when you create microbiome imbalance, so many diseases can result. And the, the gut bacteria can produce a strong acid and it can potentially create zonulin, which causes gaps between the cells in the intestines, and now you have leaky gut. So BT toxin may create holes within the cells. Roundup may create holes between the cells. Now, the gut bacteria is a factory. It produces vitamin K. It produces aromatic amino acids like tryptophan. The aromatic amino acids are absolutely essential for neurotransmitters like serotonin. Has anyone heard of serotonin? Serotonin's our friend. But it's not, Roundup is not a friend to serotonin because Roundup can block the pathway that produces L-tryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin. Serotonin, mood, behavior, depression, or happiness. I'm full, I can stop eating. That's serotonin. Think obesity. Regulates blood sugar. Melatonin, same thing. Sleep. We saw insomnia on the list. We saw anxiety. All those mood things, potentially related to these neurotransmitters. Dopamine, related to Parkinson's. Those three neurotransmitters depend on the aromatic amino acids. The aromatic amino acids depend on the shikimate pathway. Monsanto bragged for years, glyphosate blocks the shikimate pathway in plants. Humans don't have a shikimate pathway, so it's completely harmless to us. The shikimate pathway is this metabolic symphony that ends up producing L-tryptophan and tyrosine and the other aromatic amino acid that I just forgot. Maybe I've been eating Roundup. So, and so that shikimate pathway is the cause of a lawsuit, actually. A lawsuit was filed in California because of the shikimate pathway. Because people say, I've been damaged because my gut bacteria use the shikimate pathway. And Monsanto said, they, they bragged that it blocks the shikimate pathway and has no effect on humans. Now, if they knew that it had an effect on humans because we use the shikimate pathway to produce serotonin, then they're lying. We don't, want to, we don't want to trust them with our food supply. If they didn't know, then they're stupid. And we don't want to trust them with our food supply. <laughs> Roundup also damages the microvilli, the little fingers that come out of the walls of the intestines to digest and suppresses digestive enzymes. It's toxic to the mitochondria, long list of diseases there, including chronic fatigue. It, it disrupts another metabolic pathway, which is involved with producing vitamin D and also detoxing in the liver. It promotes cancer cells. In fact, it was described as a probable carcinogen last month by the World Health Organization. It's an endocrine disruptor at parts per trillion. Parts per trillion. It can promote human breast cancer cells. It can promote birth defects. It even produces formaldehyde in its breakdown product. So if you look at all of these factors, and some scientists have, there's a long list of diseases. Here's a partial list of diseases that this one review study says is linked to glyphosate. They say, all the diseases and conditions associated with the Western diet, including gastrointestinal, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, depression, autism, infertility, cancer, Alzheimer's, it goes on, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, aggression, depression, kidney failure, gluten sensitivity, etc. Roundup is sprayed on Roundup ready crops. It's also sprayed on wheat as a ripening agent 
days before harvest, and barley, and rye, and oats, and lentils, and potatoes, and sweet potatoes, all these non-GMO foods. So now more than ever, it's important to eat organic. Or know the farmer and find out if they spray. I don't have a list of the products that are never sprayed by glyphosate. I hope to get that for you, but I don't. If anyone wants to work with us to get that. But right now, the safety list is organic. Here are livers of rats that were fed Roundup Ready soybeans. We don't know if it's the Roundup or the soybeans or both that cause that gnarly, that's the scientific word, gnarliness on the right side, which is where they ate the soy versus non-GM soy. These are testicles that change from pink to blue in rats that were fed Roundup Ready soybeans. Mice fed GM soy also had damage to their testicles, including the young sperm cells. Females, rats, had damage to the uteruses and ovaries and also hormonal imbalance. When I spoke at the European Parliament years ago, I was also joined by Irina Ermakova, a senior researcher at the Russian Academy of Sciences. She gave me the following slide. So these are Russian-speaking rats. And they volunteered for a soy experiment where they were fed non GM soy versus non-GM soy starting two weeks before they got pregnant. And they continued eating the soy through lactation and more than half of the babies died within three weeks of the parents, the moms who were fed the GM soy compared to 10% death rate for the non-GM soy, 6% for the control. The babies were also smaller and could not reproduce. Hamsters fed GM soy for three generations. Most were sterile. They also died at four or five times the rate for infant mortality. Many had hair growing in their mouths. Monsanto's corn studies showed signs of toxicity when the raw data was reanalyzed by scientists. But according to Monsanto, the rats passed with flying colors. So to prove the point, Dr. Seralini and his team in France took the same group of rats, the same type of rats, the same size control groups as Monsanto, tested everything that Monsanto tested for and many more parameters and went not just for 90 days, which is the maximum that Monsanto tests for, but they went for two years. And during that two years, the group fed the GMOs died more often and in larger numbers. They also had kidney, liver, and pituitary damage. They also had multiple massive tumors. Here are the examples of the rats. Now the rat in the middle ate the genetically engineered Roundup Ready corn that we might eat, because it was Roundup Ready corn that had been sprayed with Roundup. And that group had three things, multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. The rat on the left ate the Roundup Ready corn that had not been sprayed with Roundup. They wanted to see what was causing the damage. And that group had three things, multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. The rat on the right comes from a group that only had Roundup in the drinking water but had natural corn. That group had three things, multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. So both caused the problem individually and together. Well, we're going to talk about, we're going to give some good news at the end. Then you can breathe. Don't breathe yet. <laughs> Stomachs, they're important. I have one, and so do pigs, and they're similar physiologies as humans, and their stomachs become severely inflamed in large percentage after eating genetically modified soy and corn. That's the stomach on the right compared to a natural normal stomach on the left. Cows eating genetically modified crops, discoloration, sign of accelerated aging in their innards. I've been told by butchers also, horrible stench. Maybe that's the gut bacteria. They're introducing a potato and an apple for the absolutely important and urgent need not to brown when sliced. So you cut these apples, 18 days later, it hasn't browned yet. It's a fake out. The potatoes will dry up before they turn brown. 
The technology used in these may be far more dangerous than the technology used in the soy and the corn. The technology is called double-stranded RNA. Now, double-stranded RNA uses RNA to switch off genes. I'm going to give you a story about RNA. Originally, they thought it was just a byproduct of DNA that created proteins or amino acids which were folded up into proteins and it was just a one-way thing. Now they realize little pieces of RNA can affect genetic expression and that that's partly how we're organized. It's far more complex than they ever thought. So now they're creating double-stranded RNA which is then cut into little tiny pieces of RNA between 7 and 21 nucleotides long. And all they have to do is plug in and match a sequence in the genome and shut down that gene. And that's how it works here. What if it matches another sequence? It's only as little as seven nucleotides long. We've got three billion base pairs in all sorts of sequences. What are the chances that something that small will match a portion of our genome? It's about a 100% chance. And if it does match, there's the possibility that it could reprogram our genes. For example, they fed honeybees double-stranded RNA that was supposed to be harmless and do nothing. It changed the expression of 1,461 genes. One meal change the expression for weeks. It works with mammals too. Mice fed double-stranded RNA, change in the gene expression in their liver. Scientists are concerned if we bite the apple, our genes may express themselves differently. The USDA scientists warned about it. The EPA scientists warned about it. The USDA just approved the apple and the potato without even checking the sequence matching the human genome or animal genomes. Mosquitoes. We're in Florida, so I have to talk about this. They want to release millions of mosquitoes in Key Haven, next to Key West. I went down there to testify and speak to the media, etc., about the mosquito, and I happened to run into a scientist from Oxitec who works on these mosquitoes. He was also testifying in favor of the mosquitoes. These mosquitoes are supposed to reduce the population of the brand of mosquitoes that spread dengue fever. It's been released in Cayman Islands, in Panama, in Malaysia, and are now a big, big program going on in Brazil. They put out millions of mosquitoes and dengue fever increased. But they say, it's not our fault. We need more mosquitoes. I said to, I think it was Derek from Oxitec, I said, have you ever looked at the components of the saliva of the mosquitoes that you're releasing? to see what it might do to humans? And he said, oh, we're now checking to see if the gene that was inserted into the mosquitoes produces a protein in the saliva. Now, we're now checking. This is after releasing tens of millions of mosquitoes and exposing populations in four countries. I explained to Derek, I said, you know, when a gene gets inserted into a genome, like happened in human genome, it took a gene, inserted into the human genome, up to 5% of the genes change their levels of expression. So you, doesn't it make sense not to just check for the protein that the gene expresses, but to check the entire composition of the saliva which will be circulating in the blood of humans that are bitten by your frankenbugs. And he goes, good idea. So these are the people who are actually manipulating the genome possibly for all future generations. Now they may, you may read, oh no, it's okay, they're just producing male mosquitoes. 
Well, one in 300 or so are females, and they're the biting ones. Oh, but it's okay, they're going to mate, and then they're going to have sterile offspring. Well, 3% of the offspring are not sterile in the presence of tetracycline. It's 15%. In other words, it's, an, it's a leaky technology, and they can be completely redesigning the genome of the mosquito for all future generations. Now, when Monsanto's consultant in 1999 took the stage at a biotech conference in San Francisco, he bragged about how he had worked for Monsanto, his, how they started off by saying, describe your ideal future in 15 to 20 years. And the executives of Monsanto described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds were genetically engineered and altered and patented. And Arthur Anderson, the consultant, they were also Enron's consultant, they worked backwards from that, strateg from that goal and to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. My friend said it was the most arrogant statement he'd ever heard in his life until that afternoon when another company put out a white paper projecting a 95% replacement of all commercial seeds within five years. That would have been 2004. Their goals have not gone away. They've expanded to include mosquitoes and fish and livestock and trees and bacteria and algae and nature. They want to replace nature. They want to eliminate the products of the billions of years of evolution and replace it with designer organisms designed for greater profit and control. So the entire genome, the gene pool of all living beings and all future generations is at stake right now because it's irreversible. The genes already released will outlast the effects of climate change, will outlast nuclear waste. The only thing that lasts longer than the self-propagating pollution of the gene pool is extinction. So what happened three weeks later in Europe that derailed their plan for 95% replacement of all commercial seeds? The gag order was lifted on Dr. Arpad Pustai, the world's leading scientist in his field. He had been given three million dollars to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. And quite to his surprise, discovered that they were dangerous. Went public with his concerns, was a hero for two days at his institute, and then two phone calls from the UK Prime Minister's office, got him fired the next day, gagged with threats of a lawsuit, rolled over the co coals with a terrible campaign to destroy his reputation, but seven months later, from an order of parliament on February 16th, 1999, the gag order was lifted. Over 700 articles were written in the UK press alone within a month. Within 10 weeks, there was so much concern by the consumers in Europe, it wasn't the government that reacted. It was Unilever, Britain's largest food maker committed to stop using GM ingredients on April 27th in Europe. The next day, Nestle's. The next week, everyone else. This is what we call a tipping point of consumer rejection. It happened in Europe 16 years ago. Now, we saw it happen in the United States between 2006 and 2008 against bovine growth hormone. Tipping point of consumer rejection. We see it now happening against GMOs in the United States. In 2007, 15% of Americans said they were avoiding or reducing GMOs. Last year, it was 40%. In 2012, 51% of Americans said that they were concerned about the health impacts of eating GMOs. It went up 10% by 2013. The New York Times in 2013 said three quarters of Americans are concerned about GMOs. And we achieved the tipping point that year. It was a specific moment in time, in my opinion, when the Whole Foods executive president was interviewed by AP and said when a product becomes third party verified as non-GMO, it increases sales by 15 to 30 percent. That was the moment when the food companies realized they were losing money 
if they were either using GMOs or even not verified by the non-GMO project. Hundreds of products were enrolled within the following months, creating a backlog of, of 18 months. So it was tipped in 2013. In 2014, January, Cheerios entered us into the new stage. We now have a product, a test product, in conventional supermarkets. Saying non-GMO, if it increases in market share, what happens? What are the conclusions drawn by the rest of the food industry? Well, chief competitors didn't wait. Grape Nuts declared non-GMO, front of package, full color, third party verified within two weeks. They had been planning for it. Target Home Brands, Ben & Jerry's, Smart Balance, I can't believe it's not butter, Hershey's Chocolate, Chipotle's restaurant chain, and today, Similac, infant formula, has declared it has a non-GMO variety. <laughs> today. So what happens when these companies start increasing in market share? the smart marketers and their competitors, even those who are not in the same product line, realize they can't wait till their chief competitor goes non-GMO and starts grabbing market share. So we have a tipping point to, do, to convince humans what animals do automatically. So many animals, when given a choice, refuse to eat the GMO, they'll eat the non-GMO. Pigs, cows, geese, squirrels, deer, elk, raccoons, mice, rats, dogs, chickens, buffalo, all have been shown to avoid eating GMOs when given a choice. So we have to get humans up to the level of animals. Sometimes farmers will take GM corn and non-GM corn and put them on the trees, nail them to a tree during the winter and watch what the squirrels do. And they'll watch the squirrels won't eat the GM corn. So a neighbor of one of those successful experimenters, decided to do his own experiment, bought a bag of GM corn and a bag of non-GM corn, put it in the storeroom waiting for winter. The mice did the experiment for him. Breaking into the non-GMO bag, eating it all. Breaking into the GM bag and not eating any of it. So we help people who don't have the sixth sense of animals by recommending the non-gmoshoppingguide.com website. You'll see over 31,000 products verified by, as non-GMO by the Non-GMO Project. You can also buy organic, not allowed to use GMOs, and it avoids the Roundup in all cases. And you can buy products that are listed in the shopping guide that say non-GMO or that don't list the act, the, the, that don't have any potential GMOs in the list of ingredients. And the list of all the derivatives of soy and corn, etc., are in the non-GMO guide as well. So dextrose may come from corn. Maltodextrin may come from corn, and that may be GMO. We have a five-year master plan to eliminate GMOs at the Institute for Responsible Technology. We are raising money for that. We, have, we believe we are on good track for it. We are going to, we believe, create a tipping point of food in three years and feed within five years. We need to raise about $5 million a year to make that absolutely secure. We're not waiting for it. We've already started. We put, we're underway. But the in full plan is a little expensive. But to save nature and all who eat and all living beings and all future generations, it's chump change. If you'd like to make a donation, we would love to receive it because we know exactly what to say. We know exactly who to say it to, and we know how to say it. We know the targeted demographic groups. We've already tipped the Whole Foods crowd. We now have to go to the Walmart and the Safeway crowd. You can't necessarily target the couch potato junk food eating American who hasn't yet related food to health. They'll never know that they're eating GMOs. They'll never know we got rid of it for them. <laughs> we target... Moms, pet owners, right? Pet owners, sick people, healthcare professionals, religious people that think GMO means God move over. <laughs> we know what to say, 
how to say it, who to say it to, because we have been engineering this tipping point, because we have been focused on creating behavior change messaging that has given us today's announcement by Similac. So we are incredibly successful. So successful that I am more confident than ever before that we are going to be reclaiming a non-GMO food supply. And I would like to ask your help. I want to ask you to rate yourself from 1 to 100 how vigilant you plan to be at avoiding GMOs starting now. How many people plan to be low vigilance, 1 to 20, low vigilance? Raise your hand. Camera, no one is raising their hand. 20 to 40. Ditto. 40 to 60. No one. 60 to 80. Three. 80 to 100. All right, give yourselves a hand. Now rate yourself from 1 to 100 how active you want to be sharing information about GMOs with others. 0 to 20. No one. 20 to 40. 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100. Okay, it's unanimous, just about. There you go, sold. So you see, now you know for sure that the plan can work because you just saw what it took to make this point a turning point in your digestive lives, just to hear the truth. You don't have to be skeptical saying, oh, how are you going to change people's behavior? You just saw even if you're totally vigilant from the beginning to end, you just saw what happened in the room. We just tell the truth. So we take this information and make it available in a film called Genetic Roulette, another film we're coming out with which will be even more powerful, working on this year. We take this information and make it available in books, in articles, in websites, in campaigns. I'd like you all, please, to sign up for the newsletter. Now, how many people have smartphones? You can open your smartphone now, if you want, and give us your email address. And we will participate with you in the tipping point. In fact, we are going to announce in a couple of weeks a new campaign which I haven't described. And I want to share it with you, but I can't. So I, I'll have to ask you to sign up so you can hear about it when we want Monsanto to hear about it. <laughs> Responsibletechnology.org. I'll also share with you what I'm doing on my summer vacation. I'm touring with Neil Young. I haven't gotten used to saying that yet. <laughs> he has a new album called The Monsanto Years. That's the connection. I'm not his backup singer. <laughs> So what I, what I want to share with you now is that this is, in fact, an opportunity that our ancestors never had. We're facing an opportunity to protect all who eat, to protect all living beings and all future generations. There's never been a technology that had such a huge potential negative footprint so no one in the history of humanity had a chance to do such good. So you can decide that this is a burden and a duty and a responsibility, or you can decide that this is a huge opportunity. Put it on your resume. Saved all living beings, all future generations. 2015. Yeah. So find an excuse. If you go to responsibletechnology.org, sign up for the newsletter. If you want to join a group locally to speak about GMOs, join the Tipping Point Network. If you want to learn how to speak about GMOs, go to the speaker training program. If you want to just read and understand and hear, we've got lots of materials. You all said, you all said, except a couple of you, 80 to 100%. So everyone was between 60 and 100% wanting to share this information with others. So that's what I've been working on for 19 years to be, ans be able to say, I've got what you need. So out there, I've got a right brain book called Seeds of Deception, which is all stories. It's like, what happened to Dr. Pustai 
you know, the kind of stories like he start in the middle and he's been fired from his job and now he can, he can speak and whatnot. And I have the left brain book called Genetic Roulette. And then for the quick, easy learn, I've got the Genetic Roulette movie. They're not just created out of, oh, it would be nice to do this. It's all strategic. It's all strategic to drive specific groups and specific receptivity to avoid GMOs. So if you want to participate, find out what, what information you want to share whether it's the right brain book or the left brain book or the movie or the newsletter or all of it, and share it with a thousand of your closest personal friends. <laughs> How many people are on Facebook? How many people have an email address book? How many people know anyone? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, you qualify. And you don't have to have the burden of memorizing these talking points because we have them in brochures, we have them in all sorts of formats. We have them in formats because our job is to just move that number, just ease that number. It's 40% of Americans saying they're avoiding or reducing GMOs, a lot less actually do it. Just move both of those numbers forward and we're done. We are so close. And the other side is freaking out. They're spending millions of dollars trying to discredit me and others and, and all this, everything you just heard. They're spending millions of dollars trying to create a whole social media strategy so that if anyone comes out against GMOs, there's a bunch of trolls that come on and try and discredit. They're doing all this because they're desperate, because we're winning. So now is the time to reclaim and put on our resume reclaimed, healthy, non-GMO diet for the world in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I see two hands. You're going to go first, your second, your third, your fourth. Go ahead. There were two things that were uh, demonstrably absent in the microphone. Is there a roaming, a roamer? Okay, two things that were demonstrably absent from my talk. From your talk? Yes. And I wondered why we didn't discuss the possibility of class action litigation. The second would be, what are we doing with our idiotic politicians? I can think of a few things, <laughs> but, I'm, but it's G-rated here. Um, so when I look at, I'm a strategist in a community, you know, I, I came into this whole thing as like, I want a solution. And if you look at all the things that we can do, court, court, court system is one of them. And then you have things like, Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court used to be Monsanto's attorney, and you have, um, I mean, I can just list all these things, a guy that, that struck down a class action against Monsanto and the New York Times later outed him as a former uh, attorney of record on, for Monsanto, never admitted it, never accused himself. And you could spend a fortune and many years in lawsuits and not win. I'm not against lawsuits. Steve Drucker's lawsuit forced them to give us thousands of documents, even though the, the judge had to do backflips in order to deny his, his motion. You know, they had to just, as the, the strained logic is what he described. So I'm not against that. And it's part of the bigger picture. But in looking at what is the most effective way where we have the power and don't give it away and to a judge or anything else, and we know we'll win, that's the market-based strategy. Yeah. I support court cases. I'm interviewed by lawyers all the time who are going to, going to do class actions and whatnot for lost export markets, etc. As far as politicians go, Obama's been worse than the Bush administration on GMOs. Um, Michael Taylor was put back in the FDA by the Obama administration. Um, all these people were put into, eight, eight people were put into Obama's administration or um, proposed for the Supreme Court by him, all related to the biotech industry and their support. Um, I realize that, you know, when, when 
going forward in this, you know, they've got billions of dollars, we've got a dollar ninety-five. How do we fight them? And Washington seemed like it was a little too expensive. What happened in Europe and what happens a lot is that the politicians follow the market, follow the people. Um, so in terms of this labeling thing, for example, which is an example of a policy change plan, there's ballot initiatives in four states to get labeling. We failed on all four. The other side spent $100 million lying to people, saying we're going to spend more money if it, pa if it passes. It increased the awareness of GMOs, but I think the messaging was poor. It just said right to know, and that didn't really convince anyone to not eat it. So the whole tipping point thing suffered on the opportunity cost. But for labeling, we actually need the SIP tipping point because if it passed in California, the FDA would probably just preempt it like they did with restaurant menu labeling and say, we want labeling too. And we're going to have it so that it's not a patchwork of regulations from state to state. So we're going to deny states the right to require labeling and put a national labeling strategy in place eventually. And that eventuality may be nothing, like it was with the restaurant menu labeling, or it may depend on the nature of the negotiation table in Washington, which has Monsanto on one side, consumers on the other, and the, cons and the food industry with Monsanto. Now, what if there's a tipping point and they all remove GMOs? Where are they in the, in the table? They're no longer scared of mandatory labeling, in fact, they may be in favor of it because to avoid a mandatory label may be easier than putting a non-GMO label on there. So now we have the grocery manufacturers on our side and the political will to support an industry that has just been kicked out of the United States is also depleted. So the politicians will be less likely to take up Monsanto's cause if all the food companies just got rid of their food. So with that tipping point post-tipping point negotiation table, then the FDA or the next administration may come and say, okay, we're going to do mandatory labeling. So even for the mandatory labeling, the tipping point rules. The tipping point is essential if the FDA is going to do what it's mandated to do, which is to promote GMOs. That's its instruction for the last 20 years, to promote GMOs. So I still think consumer education is primary. I understand the cafeteria at Monsanto and the cafeteria at Capitol Hill only serves organic and they do not serve GMO food. Is that true? I've never heard about Capitol Hill. Here's what I heard. That when Obama took a office in the White House, that we revealed, it revealed that um, the Bush administration was 100% organic in the White House and Laura Bush insisted on it. And then we assumed that Obama was following the course. In 1999, Adrian Bebb, I think a Friends of the Earth, sent an email out, or not an email at that time, a letter out to different food uh, managers of restaurants, including the restaurant in the headquarters of Monsanto in Europe, in England, saying, do you serve GMOs? And the manager of the restaurant in Monsanto's headquarters said, because of consumer concern, because of our customers' concern, we've removed GMOs. <laughs> <laughs> we know that a former Monsanto scientist told me that three of his colleagues who studied the milk from cows treated with Monsanto's bovine growth hormone found so much cancer-promoting hormone in the milk, the three Monsanto scientists stopped drinking milk unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. I don't think... Oh, it's working good. Um, there is an app called B-U-Y-C-O-T-T on the cell phone, yeah, yeah. which uh, for the Grocery Manufacturers Association, if the food is made by them, the app will tell you when you scan the barcode. Right, so there's a boycott or boycott application. My feeling about boycotts are this. A lot of times boycotts are principled, you know, help the farm workers, help this, help that. I feel a more potent strategy is, you want to eat that? You know, like, you, you want to turn your intestinal floor into living pesticide factories? You really want to eat that corn chip? And it's, it's a... It's not a boycott that's a traditional sense. It's like preserve your life decision. So it becomes a boy, it become, has the same impact. It's market driven campaigning, but it doesn't rely on someone to understand an issue and then resist eating something which they're attracted to because of that principle. It's resisting eating something because it's now an FSO, it's a food shaped object, and it's no longer 
in their list of actual edibles. Who has the, there you have it, go ahead. First, thank you very much for sharing all the information you have shared today, I love it. Um, but I have a question, for your average 20 year old college student that you know works and may not have the best budgeting skills ever, um, when he goes to the grocery store and there's the non-GMO food and then there's the organic food and there's the non-GMO and organic food, which one do you think he should go for you know, if he only has, say, $5 in his pocket and can only pick one of the three? So you mean, you mean conventional, non-GMO, organic, or the combination of non-GMO and organic? Yes. Well, the combination is the, is the best. It says non-GMO project verified and organic. Here's the difference. Um, Non-GMO Project Verified requires testing. If you use corn or soy or sugar, whatever, sugar beets, it requires testing to verify that you're either absent or below the threshold of 0.9% on a regular basis. Organic does not allow the use of GMOs, but they have no test requirements. So there may be some contamination. So if you have non-GMO Verified plus organic, that's the gold standard. If you had to choose between non-GMO Verified and organic, they both may end up with contamination just so you know. But because glyphosate and Roundup is sprayed on wheat, barley, rye, etc., I'd go for the organic because then you not only avoid the GMOs, you avoid a lot of the other nasties. Um, if you can't afford um, organic um, and you can't find anything that's non-GMO because you live in a food desert, well, there are, some, there are some internet programs that you can get things discounted. You can even just find non-GMO on the shelves of Walmart. You can Ragu spaghetti sauce, ragu light, it's got olive oil, ragu chunky has soybean oil and high fructose corn syrup. Just read the ingredients and see, well, this is non-GMO. It may have other chemicals in it, but it's non-GMO. So, you know, it's, when, because we move around and we don't have a lot of st stability in where we eat all the time, we gotta choose the best option for ourselves. So knowing all these little tricks, going out to eat, which is why I've traveled nine months last year, eight months the year before, I have to know how to order. What kind of oil do you cook in? Always ask that question. If it's soybean oil, corn oil, canola oil, I say, do you have any olive oil here? If they say they cook in olive oil, say, is it a blend? Because they'll say olive oil and it's half canola or 80% canola. So you ask that. Same with the salad dressing. Those are the invisible ones that, they, that are not listed. Mostly you can tell visible ones like zucchini and yellow squash is at risk, corn on the cob, polenta, etc. The invisible ones are the sugar, things like that. Who has the microphone over here? You do? Okay. Uh, yeah, you answered it, but uh, just clarify. If it says organic, it's not necessarily non-GMO? If it says organic, it's not allowed to use GMOs. If it's, yes. There's three ways, right. there's four ways that organic can be listed on the product. It could say 100% organic, it could say organic, which means at least 95%, or it could say made with organic ingredients or organic soybeans, which it means at least 70%. The rest of it, the other 30% or 5%, all have to be non-GMO. So if it says made with organic soybeans, it's all supposed to be non-GMO. If it doesn't say organic anywhere on the label except in the ingredient panel, then it doesn't tell you about anything else. You can say organic soybeans, but the canola oil might be GMO. So if you don't see it on the front of the package, read the ingredients to see if there's any at-risk ingredients. So it's supposed to be non-GMO. It doesn't have to be tested to verify. Someone over here, yes. I, oh. First of all, thank you so much for, for all work you've done. And thank you for today's presentation and for giving us this optimistic uh, belief that it will, we will win. Okay? But my question is how technically it's possible because so much produce already spoiled, so much uh, soil already like damaged. Uh, what they will do, all, what all this um, producer will do with all this food and soil, will they send it to third world countries uh, like vaccine before? What will happen? Just like, and how fast right. it could? So to transition from non-organic to organic, you need three years for the field to transition from GMO to non-GMO, immediate. You just plant non-GMO seeds. You harvest GMO, plant non-GMO. You should probably plant a different type of crop because the volunteer ungerminated, un unharvested seeds can come up and contaminate. So if you plant canola, that's GMO canola one year, and you plant non-GMO canola, 
For the next 16 years, you can have more than 1% contamination. But, so you plant something else. Now, the soil is damaged from Roundup. And Roundup, the longest recorded half-life, meaning the period of time it takes to degrade to half its quantity, the longest recorded half-life of glyphosate in soil is 22 years. It can also degrade in months. It depends on the soil conditions. There are people who are working hard every season to find remedies for the soil. And I've heard there's some good news there. I don't know the details, but I'm confident that they'll figure out some solution, perhaps some biology added to the soil. I think if we all of a sudden went 100% non-GMO today, there's not enough seed available for the farmers. So our five-year plan understands that and goes for food first and animal feed second. And that'll give them time to transition and that's also probably what's gonna happen. There'll be more pressure on human food than in animal feed. And it's just a question of substituting the non-GMO seeds for it, growing the non-GMO seeds in Hawaii or South America or whatever, while they're, you know, it's not difficult. The problem is you're gonna end up still with some level of contamination for as long as corn and soy exist, but that level of contamination will become less and less and less as all the new inputs of seed is non-GMO. So you, to, trusting, to trust the non-GMO project, you have to, in order to get verified, you have to submit your testing um, results, your testing, your sampling protocol. And if, you're, if you have detectable GMOs in the final product and you're trying to lie, you really are stupid because if someone could just pull it off the market, pull it off the shelf, test it, and if you turn out to be high and you're verified as low and you're lying, you can destroy your brand reputation forever. I mean, you know what happened to Kashi? You know, Kashi was, we're healthy. It was bought by Kellogg's and it didn't pay any attention to the GMOs. The soy in Kashi was 100% GM soy. So there was a big social media thing. USA Today picked it up. They scrambled frantically, lost a lot of market share. Now they're going non-GMO. Who has the microphone on their side? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I think that you've changed my life. Oh, thank you. No one has convinced me why I should buy organic. So even when I've been three times to Whole Foods and the people here, I said, I have blueberries, I have raspberries. And then, are they organic? And I thought, what's the big deal? I'll just go home and wash them. So you've really altered my thinking. So thank you for that. Thank Here's you for saying <laughs> that. Yeah, I'm kind of freaking out a little. <laughs> um, it's just really making me be mindful. I've never really thought about this before. Okay. May, 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 I, may I add this though? After switching to, I would go cold turkey, 100% organic immediately. Just try 100%. That's my recommendation. But I his, his I, hold, on, hold on, let me just let me finish. I wouldn't ease into it if you can because now you just came off this course. You want to dive in, so go 100%. Okay. And then take notes in your mind, in, well, written I've down. I've written every word down that you no, said. No, no, but I say take notes about your health. Okay. All right? Notice the change. Notice if your energy level gets better, your sleep cycle, your everything. I will. And the thing is, that's what's going to be really convincing to you and to your good friends. Because, you know, there's the theory and then there's the life energy that rushes through you when you get real good food. Like, so, I can't wait to call my kids and... Hand them all the notes. I've taken notes on everything. But I had someone leave, a, leave a, a lecture texting their kids saying, don't eat any more GM food. The son texted back, what's wrong with General Motors? Ah. <laughs> Here's my one question. Sure. Okay, I am going to follow this. But like, take bananas and oranges and fruits that are in a skin or pomegranates. It's still not, they still have to be totally organic too? I don't know. I don't know if they're sprayed by what they're sprayed with. I don't know if the spray, see, what the problem is this. The, I don't think the Environmental Working Group, which has that list, focuses on glyphosate because the, the USDA does not do any testing for glyphosate. So we want to initiate testing. That's part of our plan. We're raising money for it. We want to be able to answer that question. So I don't know. So Sorry. you're saying don't take any chances, go organic. I would say if you can afford it, and I would say I would move some of your budget into what the What about budget. for my dog? 
What about dog food? I, don't I would know go what organic to buy with, now. I'd go organic with the dog food and watch the energy level. I interviewed a, a, a um, thank you. I interviewed, interviewed a vet three days ago, and he said, "It's like the, the dogs are so tired. The dogs and cats are so tired. They switch to organic, and they're like puppies again." Yeah. So you'll, that'll be convincing. Someone has a, a, a here. I think this is working. Okay. I wanted to thank you also. Thank you very much. Um, I've been following the GMO just movement uh, for the past three years because I got very sick and um, I was just floored as to what's out there and what we're eating and how sick it's making us. Um, I did ask this the other night. I just wanted to know if, if you had some in, insight on it. I read an article that, that labeling is going to change in the USDA where organic will include some GMOs. No. Is organic is not going to include any GMOs uh, at this point. There's no intention of that. There's no expectation of that. When they were originally folding the organic program into a USDA oversight program, they wanted to include GMOs, sewer sludge, and radiation, and they got swamped with over 300,000 letters, and that's sacred. Um, so I don't believe that there's any... GMOs allowed. Now, if someone has information other than that, let me know. Drucker. Steve Drucker. Steve's over there. If he has any information, he'll let me know. Um, so I don't believe that there's any GMOs uh, that are illegally allowed, but sometimes, you know, sometimes the inspector won't necessarily ask about the soy lecithin in a minor ingredient. It doesn't mean that it's not part of the law, okay. not part of the, the standards. Right, I, I've got 10 seconds left. Okay, just my next question is, was you, ha you had said that 70% of, let, let's say, a produce is organic, but it might have some contamination? No, what I'm saying is if a label says made with organic blank, then it has to contain at least 70% organic ingredients. Okay. But the other 30% have to be non-GMO. What about produce? I'm produce, talking about okay. cucumbers, tomatoes. So here's the good news on the produce. In the produce section, here are the following risks in a produce section. Zucchini, yellow squash, papaya, if it's from Hawaii or China, corn on the cob, edamame. And if they sell tofu in the produce section, tofu. That's it. No other, at this point, no other fruits or vegetables are genetically engineered today and commercialized. Apples and potatoes, apples may appear later this year, potatoes may appear next year, but right now, if you cook from scratch and you buy produce, this is the same answer to those that, make, that have their own gardens. Those are the seeds to look out for. But that's the good news. So China is very pivotal. We just, we're trying to raise money for a program to make genetic roulette available to the Chinese-speaking people. Um, I've been to China three times. And um, it's now, it's USDA is... It's USDA, it's Department of Agriculture, is now sensitive to public opinion. And public opinion, we have found that the most impactful tool we've ever studied and tested for changing someone's opinion on GMOs is the movie, Genetic Roulette. Testing people before and after in the same way we tested you. You know, rate yourself from one to 100. Absolutely consistent. So we have it dubbed in Chinese, and we want to introduce that throughout China, online, for free, supported by American dollars to help us. And the thing is, if they say no to the potato or the apple, it may not be commercialized here. Because Syngenta introduced a corn here that was not accepted in China. China rejected, genetically, rejected all corn shipments for months, costing one to two billion dollars, Syngenta got sued by 180 farmers in the United States. Companies are not willing to put out a product in the United States that could interfere with U.S. exports to China. So if we can stop China from, improve, from approving 2,4-D Agent Orange crops that are engineered not to be killed by being sprayed with a component of Agent Orange, that's been delayed until China approves it or not. So that's one of our international gambits. That's, that's where we have to go with government policy, you know. Can't just deal with it on the, on, the, on the consumer level, but we think because they're paying attention to consumer opinion, we might have a big influence on the policy levels in China.
All right, we are ending now. So I want to give you, I, I never know what I'm going to say at the end, but I always say, let me end with this, and then I figure out what I'm going to say. Let me say this. Uh, we're going to be giving a talk tonight at the, at the panel. It'll be Steve Drucker, Claire Cummins, and myself. We're going to be going into more, uh, we'll be able to answer more of your questions. But this is, it's, I would say, I'm going to comment on what I said before. Make your decision now. You've just heard the information. It will only get less in its influence. So don't put off the decisions. You've already, some of you made a decision to be more vigilant at avoiding, more vigilant at getting the word out. So make your, you have a half an hour break, make your plans, how you want to get the word out, how you want to put your footprint on protecting all living beings and all future generations. And the next time I come here, it'll be a celebration lap. Yeah.